you're, if you're like me a little bit, when you do hit the Christmas holidays, which happened at 12 o'clock on uh, 12 a.m. on Friday morning, that's when Christmas hit, um, at times you'll kind of reminisce back to when you were a kid. You'll kind of think back to Christmas growing up. I know I, I do that almost every year because, you know, we had great Christmases when I was a kid, and so it's pretty common for me to kind of look back at, at Christmas uh, each year when Christmas kind of shows up. And uh, earlier this week, uh, when I was kind of thinking back on Christmas, um, I, I began to realize, you know, life has changed a lot, at least since I was a kid. I, I was born in 1960, so when, when I was, you know, seven, eight, nine years old, life was completely different, or a lot of things were, were different. Now, when I was growing up, we had three stations on our TV, three you had antennas. We called them rabbit ears. Does anybody remember what you put on the rabbit ears to get better reception? Yeah. Aluminum foil. Yeah, that was, that was the most important piece of equipment in the house was that aluminum foil. And I think, and again, I was a kid, but I think you might pick up a fourth channel every now and then, VHS, maybe something like that. I think it was like channel three uh, for us. But uh, yeah, you got three channels is what you got. Now, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds. I, we have Netflix. I don't know why. I spend an hour looking through Netflix and can't find anything I like. I get so frustrated because I, it, it never ends. It's a constant circle. I keep waiting to get back to where I started, and I never get back there. Uh, on our Comcast account, uh, we, we don't have the, just the basic Comcast because, you know, I wanted some sports channels, and Lisa wanted some of the old, old movies like um, the Turner Classic movies, and so we went up a step. So I think we have about 70 channels, 65, 70 channels, just on our Comcast, and um, we watch three. That's <clears throat> so all we look at is three channels. So we're back, back to where we were. I mean, life has changed a lot. And, and, and a, a remote control if you're from New York, you'd say, forget about it. When you were a kid, you did not have a remote control. Right now, the remote control is, if someone came in and robbed our house, as long as they left the remote control, we would be okay. <laughs> we did not have that as a kid. You know what the remote control was as a kid? The kids. I think that parents had kids, so they had someone to turn the channel when uh, back, back in the... And, and look, video games, we didn't know what video games were. The first video game I remember coming out and I might be wrong, maybe there was another one before then, but I think it came out when I was about 12 years old, and it was the most exciting thing that had happened to us as kids. And in fact, I have a video of the first video game that I remember that was so exciting. I'm telling you today, it would take 30 seconds for kids to get bored of that game right there. <clears throat> Life has changed that much. You can turn it off now. You don't have to keep playing. <laughs> Whoever's playing the game, you can stop. So, I mean, life is different. We grew up outside. That's, we, we went outside. The, the main reason we went outside is because mom said, get outside. You don't stay in the house, you're bugging me. We'd go outside. We'd come home from school, we went outside. We went out till it was time to eat. It was kind of interesting. The neighborhood we lived in wasn't a really big neighborhood, uh, but it had a park, a grassy area that we used to go down. We'd come home from school, and we went and played until it was time to eat. That's just the way it was. If you didn't have friends available to play that day, you had imaginary friends. And uh, when I was growing up, when it was time to eat, my dad would come out and whistle for us. Um, he, I don't know, he used to tell me that he was a state champion, champion whistler. I don't even know if there was such a thing, but he could whistle. You could hear him through the neighborhood, and when he would whistle, my friends would say, hey, your dad's calling, you got to go. Uh, the, the, the sad thing is when my dad, at times he had to work night shift uh, um, um, at Delta Airlines, so he wasn't there, so my sister would call us, and my sister didn't know how to whistle. And so my sister would come out to call us for dinner, and this is what she would do. You want to turn me down just a little bit here, uh, Bob? She would go, whoop, whoop. <laughs> For an eight-year-old kid, that's the most embarrassing sound you will ever hear in the neighborhood. My friends are going, hey, is that for you, Jim? No, I have no idea who that is. I don't know. I'm good to go. I, it just the way it was. We, you know what? It just, life was different. But then I begin to realize not everything is different from when I was a kid. One of the things that's the same is that Christians still are not very comfortable sharing their faith. 
we weren't back then either. Uh, when I was about 10 years old, we had a calling night at the church, Tuesday night. Go up to the church, the preacher would have some cards, you go out and you make calls. I got to go with my dad a few times. We were lucky if there was a couple of elders, a couple of deacons, and maybe a congregational member or two, but that's all that ever came out to calling night. Why? Because we're just not comfortable sharing our faith. Now, we try to make it a little bit easier today. We say, look, don't, don't, don't be concerned about sharing the gospel. Just, just invite people to church. That's all. Just, just, just invite them to church. That, that's, that's good enough. And, and look, there, there's some truth to that. In fact, this sermon actually falls at a really good time for us because uh, starting uh, the, the Christmas season is one of the times, I think, that people are most receptive to the gospel. I mean, they, they hear it everywhere they go in Christmas songs. They see it in nativity scenes. Churches have events to make it a little bit easier to invite people to. We've got a children's Christmas play on the 17th. We've got a Christmas Eve service on the 24th. A little bit easier to invite people to come to those things because it's not really like church. But the problem is inviting people to church is not really sharing the gospel. Well, we've got to talk a little bit about sharing the gospel today. And I want you to know, and I'm just going to be open and transparent with you, it's not easy for me to share the gospel. I have an outgoing personality, and I can talk to, to strangers, and I can, I can visit with them and find things I have in common. But even as a minister of over 34 years, it is not easy for me to tell people about Jesus Christ. It's, it's not an easy thing. And so I really want this to be more, but let me visit with you, not let me preach to you. And if I had a chair, I might pull it up and sit on it to visit with you, but... It seems like I do better when I walk. I tend to think better when I walk. So, but I just want you to see it kind of as a visit. I understand. I'm not here to pound you. I'm not here to drive you into the ground about sharing your faith because I know it's not an easy thing to do, but I also know it's something that Scripture makes very clear that we need to be doing. You might remember a couple months ago when I started my sermon series on the book of Malachi. I said I went on the Internet to some of the bigger churches to see their sermon series and see how they dealt with a sermon series on the book of Malachi uh, to see how long they did it, what the themes they did, that kind of things. And I said I couldn't find any churches that had done an actual series from the book of Malachi. But almost every one of them had at least three, maybe even four or more sermons throughout the year about sharing their faith. And the reason is this. Those churches that are growing and have, have, have gotten some size to them understand that God's plan from the beginning in order for the kingdom to grow was for people to share the gospel with other people. That's how God meant it to be. That's how he developed it. And he wants the kingdom to grow, folks. It says that he doesn't want anybody to perish but all to come to the knowledge of God. He wants his kingdom to grow. All churches should be growing. All churches should be getting bigger. We have to get into the plan. And the plan that God always had was what they called multiplication. You share the gospel with other people. I don't believe they had a fall festival at the temple. I don't believe they were running a Labor Day picnic at the tabernacle. Now, don't get me wrong. Those are great things to do, and we hope to get people in. But the way that is most effective for the kingdom to grow it's when people share the gospel with other people. It's multiplication. Someone shares it with me, my parents. I then share it with someone else. That person shares it with someone else. Now, while these folks are sharing with someone else, my parents are sharing it with somebody else. I'm sharing it with somebody else. And it begins to multiply. All throughout the New Testament, the book of Acts, it talks about that the church multiplied. That's the word that's used. It started with 3,000 and went to 5,000 men, it says. And then the word is multiply. Because that's how God intended it to be. But there's another reason why sharing your faith is so important. And that is what we've been talking about with our sermon series on foundations. And this is the last of this sermon series. This is an element that every Christian needs to have in their life in order to have spiritual maturity. That's what we've been talking about. If you want spiritual growth, if you want spiritual maturity, these are the areas that need to be in your life to help you get to that. And here's why this is part of that. Because almost everything else we do in the church is for us. We get. We get, we get, we get. If you did that in the physical world without giving back out, you begin to have physical problems. I saw a sign one time, and I know it's, gross sounding but it was are you a constipated christian the concept is think about it we come to worship to feel good 
We go to Sunday school and Wednesday nights so that we can learn. We become a part of a family group so that we can have relationships with each other. And what's happening is we're taking, we're taking, we're taking. And if there isn't a point of where we are giving to others and reaching out to others, we will begin to have some problems spiritually. And so this concept of sharing your faith and sharing the gospel is something we need for spiritual maturity. So that's what we're going to talk about for a few minutes today. I'm going to try again not to preach down at you, preach at you, pound, just, just kind of visit with you of what I know because I've experienced it too. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul kind of describes this, this concept of, of sharing your faith from a little bit different perspective. But I think it helps us understand a little bit of what's happening here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you're having a problem finding 2 Corinthians, get to the New Testament. First four books are the Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Then you'll see Romans. Then you'll hit 1 Corinthians. And of course, 2 Corinthians just follows it. And go to chapter 5, verse 11. I'm, I'm going to kind of jump through our text. I'm not going to read it completely through, but I'm going to hit the verses. You'll know where we are here. We're going to begin with verse 11, chapter 5. It says, Since then we know what it is to fear God, we try to persuade men. Interesting term that Paul uses there. Jump down to verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Jump down if you would to verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. He's setting us up here, folks. That's what he's doing. God's love compels you because God died for you. You should live for other people. What does that mean? Will you become a new creation? What does that mean? Verse 18. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. There it is. Your love, his love compels us. You become a new creation. You're now more concerned about other people. You've been reconciled. Now you are to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation. Keep going, verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sin against them. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God was making this appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now look, 21, this is, this is why God's love compels us. This is what it's all about. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's talk about this for a minute. So Paul says, here's how this works. When you have been reconciled, then you are to be reconciling. When you have been reconciled, then you are to be involved in the ministry with the message of reconciliation. What does it mean to be reconciled? It means to restore the relationship with God. The relationship with God was torn apart and divided because of our sin. Anybody that has ever sinned, you were separated from God. Because God can't be with sin. And so some way or another, that had to be restored. We couldn't do it on our own. And so what we're told is that he made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's reconciliation. Jesus Christ dies on the cross for us so that our sins are taken away and we can have a restored relationship with Christ. Now understand this, that restored relationship with Christ only happens when you accept Jesus Christ. The work has been done. But it's not until you accept him. Then once you accept him, you now are reconciled with the Father. Do you know what this means here? You now have a relationship with the Father. You can go to him anytime you want, and you can ask him anything that you want. Isn't that what the Scripture teaches? Who's that for? For those of us who have been reconciled. For those of us who now have a restored relationship with the Father. And on one passage, it even says that you can call him Abba Father. Now what does that mean? Well, some translate that to mean daddy, that you can call him daddy. And maybe so. I don't know. I struggled with this for years because I'm just, I've got that little traditional running through me growing up in the church, and it's just hard for me to call God daddy. It's just hard. It just doesn't seem to be quite reverent enough. But, but a lot of scholars believe that's what it's saying, daddy. It wasn't until I had grandkids that I really understand what's being taught there. See, Everybody else in the family chose easy names for the kids to learn to pronounce. Uh, Mom, of course, Dad, Mommy, Daddy, Nona, um, Chris's dad, 
Uh, he was one name, but Lisa named him something different. So he's Papa, so that's easy. But I wanted to be Grandfather. And they all said, now, if you're Grandfather, they're not going to learn to pronounce that name. It's going to take them longer. And it did. It took Bailey, my first grandchild, it took her quite a while to learn to say Grandfather. Now, our second grandchild, who now is almost three, she just calls me Foffer. Because she wasn't able to say grandfather, so she just went to Foffer. She didn't even try to do grandfather now. And look, from the time she was born, I would pick her up, and I'd hold her close to me, and I would whisper in her ear, I'm grandfather, 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 grandfather. Just trying to get her to learn, and now it's Foffer, and that's it. It's Foffer. But here's what I learned a few years ago. When Bailey couldn't pronounce grandfather, One day she walked into the church here on a Wednesday night and she saw me and she screamed and she ran up to me and she grabbed me and I thought, you know what, I don't care what she calls me. You can call me dad, you can call me grandfather, you can call me foffer, you can call me whatever you want. All I want is for you to want to run up and hug me. That's what being reconciled to the father is. God says, I don't care what you call me. Call me father. Call me dad, call me daddy, call me father. I don't care. What I want you to do is I want you to run to me and I want you to hold me because you can do that now because you've been reconciled. Everybody with me to that point? So we've been reconciled. Paul says because you have been reconciled, because I've been reconciled, we now are to have the ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? We are to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to other people so that they can experience a restored relationship to the father that we already enjoy. That's what he's saying. That's what sharing the gospel is all about. It's telling people what you already have. That's what he asks us to do. Now, let's, let's talk a little bit about this. One, I want to share something with the interesting that I had never seen before regarding sharing your faith or sharing the gospel with, with other people. Take a look at this passage here in John. Let me set the stage. Woman at the well. Jesus is making his way back to Jerusalem. He goes to Samaria. We talked about this not that long ago. Comes across a woman at the well there in the middle of the day. He begins to talk to her. He tells her some things about her life that no one's supposed to know. And, and then he tells her about living water. And, and, and she runs back into the town and tells everybody back there what Jesus has done. And this is what the town says to her. They said to her, now I don't know how long this was. This could have been weeks later. Jesus could have stayed there for a number of days. We don't know. But they finally say to this woman, we no longer believe just because of what you say. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Look, that verse got me to thinking that let me tell you what sharing the gospel is. Sharing the gospel is not just helping an unbeliever become a believer. Sharing the gospel means helping an immature Christian become a mature Christian. That's sharing the gospel. You share with someone about Jesus Christ. They accept Jesus Christ and become a Christian. Part of sharing the gospel is helping them go from being an immature Christian to a mature Christian. Have you ever thought about that, folks? Think about this for a minute. The Great Commission, our marching orders, Matthew chapter 28, go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Whose responsibility is that to do that? Anybody that's a follower of Christ, right? But then he says, and teach them to obey all things. How come we seem to stop our responsibility once they become a Christian? For years I've told you all, and I've, uh, churches I've been in, that the church is not the main teaching arm for our children. We're just a support system to the family. The main teaching arm for children should be in the home. The church is to be a support by making sure we're teaching solid teachings. The church is not the main teaching arm for adults, folks. That is you mentoring those people that you've shared the gospel with. That's how it works. Have you ever wondered why Christians seem to just die on the vine? Why they never grow? Well, because once they become a Christian, we throw them into a class once a week and expect them to become mature Christians. You don't do that at your job. You have constant training. You have hours you have to put in. But we do that at the church. That's not how God planned it to be. Sharing the gospel is helping unbelievers become believers and helping immature Christian become mature Christian and it is your job to mentor those that you're sharing the gospel with it almost doesn't make sense to say we have a mentoring program really how do you work it I don't know when someone joins the church we just pull someone out and say hey listen we want you to mentor them that doesn't make sense the person that mentors them is the one that is sharing the gospel with them and has been 
Now let me tell you something else of what he says here when it comes to reconciliation. This concept of reconciliation, he says, it's a message. In fact, he says you are ambassadors. Has anybody ever heard the statement, always preach the gospel, the gospel and when necessary, use words? Have you ever heard that? That's really nice, but it's not biblical. Paul says, wait a minute, sharing the gospel requires you to use words. It is the message of reconciliation. An ambassador would take the message from the king and take it to the people. Folks, look, I love that we want to reflect Christ and say, that's what's important. As long as people see Christ in me, then I'm sharing the gospel. <clears throat> this past week, um, I went over to this store called Mailboxes. It used to be, I think I'm pointing right, is this where Cato is right now? Am I close? It used to be where Cato is. Are you all familiar with this? It's, uh, you go in and you can send things by FedEx and, and UPS or mail or whatever. Well, they moved. They moved now over to uh, a little further down Blaney where um, Fortis College is. And so I went in there. I had this label for FedEx and some stuff I needed to send back. And also I needed to make a copy of Lisa's license. So I walked in. And I gave her the, the information. I didn't know if it was going to cost me to mail the package. I was just going to pay for both of them together. I don't use the carry cash, so I was going to use my debit card. Gave her Lisa's license. She ran a copy. She came back. She put everything together. She put the label on. I said, how much do I owe you for the package? She says, nothing. It's free. And I said, well, how much do I owe you for the copy here? And she says, well, it's nine cents, but don't worry about it. It's fine. You don't need to pay for it. I said, really? She said, yeah, now I, I know her. I don't know her name. She doesn't know my name. I might recognize her if I saw her out at another store. I said, you sure? She said, yeah, don't, don't worry about it. I said, okay, thank you. I leave, I get in my truck, I notice a quarter there on my change, uh, my change, whatever it is there in my truck. So I picked it up, get out of the truck, walk back in, I lay it on the counter, I said, look, I just want to go ahead and pay for that and leave a little extra change for someone else. As I turned to leave, she said, can, you, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah, what? She goes, I've never seen anybody do that ever in my whole life. I've never. I've never noticed anybody that would come back to pay nice things. You know what? Jesus Christ must be in you. I want to become a Christian. I want to, I, I, I want to give my life. I want to throw my life down on the altar of God right now because I've just never seen anybody do that. And that is such an amazing thing. And so I, can you just tell me how to do that? That sounds silly, doesn't it? Because that's not what happened. Now I did take the quarterback in. I did do that. But she didn't run after me because I happened to reflect Christ in my life by doing something that was right and good. Because that's not what sharing the gospel is. That has an element of it. That gives you credibility in your message. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But just because you reflect Christ does not mean you have shared the gospel. Paul says you've got to use words. To share the gospel, you've got to be able to tell people about reconciliation and being restored back to the Father. Now, God has made it a little bit easy for us, and we don't even realize it. Let me show you what I mean. Take a look here, if you would, in Acts. Is it Acts? Yeah, Acts 17. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Now, here's what this passage says. You live where you live because that's where God wants you to live right now. And you live where you live when you live there because that's when God wants you to live there. That's what he's saying. God has you right now in the neighborhood that he wants you in. God has you in the job that he wants you in. God has you in the play places that you go because that's where he wants you. That's what this is saying. God has put you exactly where you are. So that means we need to develop a sensitivity to begin to recognize opportunity to share the gospel with people. That means in your neighborhood you're alert to maybe someone you know that really needs to know a little bit about Jesus. At your job places, you know those co-workers that need to know that Jesus died for them. For those of you who have kids in baseball or grandkids in baseball or granddaughters in plays or, or wards, you see those parents all the time. You probably see those parents more. If you've got a kid on a baseball traveling team, you see those parents all the time, more than you see anybody else. And God says, I've got you there for a reason, not for your kid to become a professional baseball player. I've got you there so that you can share the gospel with those other parents. 
That's what he's saying here, folks. It begins to give us a sensitivity that we begin to look at the opportunities and see them. We don't right now because we think it's all just hit or miss. It's just all by chance. It's not. God has you right. Now, he might move you next week to a different neighborhood. He might move you to a different job in the next two months. But he's going to have you where he wants you so that you will be sensitive to the people around you and looking for opportunities to share your faith with them. So let's get a little bit practical. How do we do it, Jim? It's not easy. I know. I'm, I know that. Look, folks, I can talk to someone about golf all day long. I can talk to someone about family. I, 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 I start conversations with visitors, and we can talk about fishing. But it's not always easy to talk about Christ, but maybe we need to see if we can't simplify Let's. Let's see if we can get to an understanding of how we do this. I, I want to show you. What do I have? A scripture first. I want you to come back to that. Go to the next screen for me, Carl. I got them backwards. Uh, put it all up there, if you would. All right, so this is, do I have, okay. So this is the breakdown. This is the breakdown. The key here is keep it simple and emphasize God's love. We, we've made it too hard, I think, sometimes. We really need to keep it simple. Now, the three things before this, share our problems, share the remedy, and share the rep- response. I'm going to come back to that. But all of that can be tied into your testimony, or it can come after your testimony. Now go to my scripture, Carl, of John chapter 4. Back to the woman at the well. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. See, we keep it simple by sharing our testimony. What did this woman know about Jesus as far as we know? We knew that Jesus, some way or another, knew something about her. He knew that she had been married five times and the person that she was with now, she was living with. We, we know that she knew that Jesus offered some sort of living water that could make a difference in her life. Now maybe there was more. Maybe Jesus shared a lot with her. Maybe he went back and showed the Old Testament. She wasn't a Jew, so she probably wasn't looking for a Messiah to come and set up an earthly kingdom. She might not have been tied into too much idolatry. Maybe she might have been. Uh, We don't don't really know what all she knew, but whatever it was, that's what she went and told this city. She told the city what she knew about Jesus. That's all you have to do, folks. You share what you know about Jesus. Now, the easiest way to remember this is using some letters. B.C., before Christ. Tell people what your life was before you met Christ. For some of you, I mean, you, you couldn't get any lower. You were involved in everything you shouldn't be involved in. That was you before Christ. You were just down at the bottom. You were selfish. You were chased after. Maybe, maybe, maybe some of you did things you shouldn't have done legally. Maybe some of the things you did was just morally wrong, but that's who you were before Christ. For some of us, before Christ, we grew up in the church but we were still missing peace and abundant life and we had to make a decision on our own. We couldn't just follow what our parents taught us. And so we're still something missing there for Christ. Then you do AD, at my decision. What happened at your decision? The day you accepted Christ, you know what happened. Tell about it. Why did you accept him? What made you choose to accept Christ on that particular day? And then there's AC, after conversion. Tell them what Christ has done for you since you've been a Christian. Tell them about the peace you have in difficult times. Tell them how you've gone through the loss of a child to cancer and yet you felt strength from God. Tell them how financially you just lost it all, but yet you just knew that God was there and continued to give you the abundant life and he provided your needs for you even in the midst of that. You tell him, you tell them what he has done for you after your conversion that's your testimony and it's yours don't make it up you don't need to it's what you know about god now in that testimony and you can go back to the other screen now if you want carla in that testimony or afterwards you need to make sure these three things are in there you need to make sure that they know that we all have a problem we have sin the bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god and if they go i don't know i'm a pretty good person listen you take them to the ten commandments you don't have to know all the ten commandments Just throw some out there, all right? Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? And that doesn't mean you put a curse word at the end of his name. It just means that you used his name out of anger or frustration. Have you ever stolen anything? No, never stolen anything. Never taken a paper clip or a pen from work? Well, they say it's okay at work to do that. Okay, well, have you ever stole time from somebody? 
You ever tell someone you were going to be somewhere and you didn't show up till 15 minutes later? You just stole the most precious commodity that all of us have, and that's time, because you said you would be there. That's stealing, folks. Have you ever lied to your spouse, to your parents, to a boss, to a coworker? Ever lied? All of a sudden, they begin to see, yes, we all have sin. So you've got to share that with them. And you need to remind them, the Bible says, that the wages of sin is death. Not physical death, because we're all going to die, but the death that's talking about there is spiritual death. You will be separated from God for all eternity. It's called hell in Scripture. I want you to tell them the problem, whether that's in your testimony or it's afterwards. Share the remedy. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of eternal life is Jesus Christ. You tell them how he died on the cross for us. How he was perfect and yet he took our place. He became our substitute. He bore the separation from God so that we don't have to. You tell them the remedy. And then you tell them the response. You've got to receive him. You've got to accept his gift. You do that through faith. What is faith? Believing Jesus Christ is God's son. Repenting. Being willing to make him Lord of your life and do what he wants and submitting and immersion. And the Bible says at that point, look, at that point, I love this, at that point that you have faith, you receive forgiveness of sins and the presence of God in your life. And you know what Paul calls that? A restored relationship with God or reconciliation. You're now with him again and not separated by sin because sin is gone. You emphasize his love. He did it out of love. And maybe you quote the scripture that we all know and even those that you're talking to knows. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? That's how you share your testimony. Now look, folks, maybe you begin by praying every morning, God, please help me to see the opportunity to share the gospel. Or maybe you pray, God, I don't really know anybody that's not a Christian. Everyone I know is a Christian. Could you bring someone into my life that maybe is not a Christian that I can maybe begin to develop a relationship with so that I can share the gospel with them? Why is that wrong to pray for that every day? Do you know that for the past five months, I've gotten up every morning and I've prayed, Lord, please sell that house in Georgia. Every morning I've prayed for that. Please sell that house. You're sovereign. You can do it. And news is, and I'm asking you to continue to pray for another two days, we think the closing goes through Tuesday. We we think. That's when it's supposed to. But every morning I've prayed for that. Lord, please sell that house. When Hope, my daughter, was pregnant with her second child, some of the sonograms came back that there was a little concern about something they were seeing. Every day from the time I found out, which must have been five or six months the time she had the baby, I prayed every day that God would make sure that baby was healthy and whole. Why is it so wrong to every morning get up and say, God, please help me to be alert to any opportunity you might give me to share the gospel? Or God, look, please bring someone into my life that needs to hear the gospel because most of the people I know already know the gospel. Why would we pray for those things but not for this? Because we want God to give us those things. We're a little hesitant to want him to give us someone to share the gospel with. But yet that's how we grow. Real quick, I want to do two things, I hope. I thought about Jesus as the great evangelist, maybe. And I began to look at the times that he shared the gospel with people, and I saw some things in common. First of all, he went. Now, it would say, well, this person came to him, but Jesus was always moving to different regions in order to share the gospel. Look, no one's going to come and knock on your door and say, hey, look, I, 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 I heard you were a Christian. Tell me about Christ. You've got to be out there looking for those opportunities, folks. Second, he performed miracles before he would share the the gospel in essence. So are you saying that I should perform miracles, Jim? No, if you can, that would be good. It'll help you go a long way in convincing that person. No, but what was the purpose of miracles? Have you ever thought about it? The purpose of miracles was to confirm the message and the messenger. It was to show that what the person was getting ready to say was truth from God. What is it that confirms our message today? It is your lifestyle. 
That's where the lifestyle comes into play. That's where reflecting Christ comes into play. That's where wearing the t-shirt that says Jesus is the reason for the season comes into play. Not so someone can tackle you in the mall and say, hey, tell me about Jesus. It's so that when you do tell them about Jesus, they say there's credibility to your message because I can see you living it in your life. Make sense? See, we've made the reflection the gospel. The reflection is the confirmation of the gospel that you share. He, he dealt with where they were hurting, where they were struggling. See, when you have relationships with people, you know what they're going through, and everyone is looking for peace and abundant life in this world, and you have the answer to it, and you say, look, I know it's got to be hard what you're going through, and I don't know that if God will ever take it away from you, what I do know is that he will give you the ability to get through it in a way like you never have before. You have the answer, and you know what else? He was honest with them. He told the rich young ruler, man, sell it all and give to the poor. He told Nicodemus, you've got to be born again, which means, Nicodemus, you've got to start all over again. When you share the gospel, be honest, folks, with them. Make sure they're, they're very clear on what you're sharing. Because a lot of times we're afraid we're going to offend them, and so we water down the message, and that does no one any good. I want to show you one more thing. I want you to go to Revelations chapter 2. Revelations chapter 2. So my job this morning is to encourage you, it's to challenge you, it's to walk alongside of you because this is not easy for me either. I have a little bit better of a vantage because if I say to someone, uh, if they say to me, what do you do for a living? I say, I'm a minister. Well, there's kind of an expectation there. I have a minister friend that says, anytime someone says to them, what do you do for a living? He goes, I'm a minister. So you do know at some point we're going to have to do this. And so they know that at some point he's going to talk to them about Christ. And maybe that's something I can do. You've got to find a way to do it yourself. But I'm here to challenge you and encourage you. You can do this, folks. And it's part of spiritual maturity. Be alert to the opportunities. Share your testimony. You know the story. It's very simple. But I found something interesting in Revelation chapter 2. We got these letters to, the, to these different churches. And here in Ephesus is the letter that God sends to them. To the angel of the church at Ephesus, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand um, and walks among the seven golden lamps. And talking about God. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you, uh, uh, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You've persevered and have endured hardship for my name and, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You're forsaking your first love. Remember the height from which you fall and repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from that place. Now look, folks, this church had a couple really good things going for them. One, they, they were persevering under hardships, which meant that they understood the ultimate victory, that they had the ultimate victory, that this was not their, their eternal destination that heaven was. And they were able to be perseverant through hard times because they knew that this life would end and and, and, and heaven would be theirs. I think most of us understand that. Most of the people that I've talked to that's gone through hardships in this church, they're able to get through it because they know that this isn't going to be what they will experience for all eternity. Many of you have persevered in a mighty way. He said the second good thing they did was that they dealt with doctrine correctly. They knew doctrine and they wouldn't let false teachers come into the church. But he said they were lacking one thing. They lost their first love. And this was so bad that if they didn't get this fix, when God came back, he would remove the lampstand from this church, which meant Christ would be taken from the church. He was the lampstand, the light. What could it be that was so bad? They were doing some good things. It, that could be our church. We're solid in doctrine. Our elders, man, if there's any false doctrine taught in this church, they would deal with it. We are solid in doctrine. And many of you, have, I've already said, have persevered through hardships because you know that you have the ultimate victory in heaven. What is it that was so bad that they lost that these things didn't outweigh that? Well, it can't be theology because they were doing theology correct. It can only be one thing. It had to be people. They weren't loving people anymore. It wasn't about others anymore. 
And I don't know, maybe they were fighting in the church. Maybe they were gossiping about others in the church. Or maybe they'd stop sharing the gospel to others. Maybe that's the first love that was gone. And I want you to think about this church for a minute. The church in Ephesus. Paul founded it. Timothy was its pastor, and the Apostle John was one of their elders. I don't know if you can get better leadership than that. And yet, they lost their first love, which had to be people. Don't lose it, folks. You've experienced being reconciled to God. Help others know what it means to call him Father. Dad, Daddy, Grandfather, Fawfer. Because it's a great experience. And many of the people that God has put you close to have no idea what it is, but you do.